Good evening. Where do British Columbia's universities go from here? With a provincial government which admittedly is in pretty difficult financial straits. And I have a wealth of knowledge with me tonight, but more of that after Steve gives you the rundown. Canada's signature was a slap shot during Expo 86. It was touted as the world's largest hockey stick, propping up the world's tallest flagpole. But what of its future? We'll find out tonight. Rumors persist that the seal hunt is about to be given the go-ahead by our federal government, and already there are repercussions in the West. There is a threat of another boycott of BC canned salmon spearheaded by the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Tonight, Mike Hunter, president of the Fisheries Council of BC. The Human Rights Council says an employer can't refuse a woman a job just because she's pregnant. But Jim Mercier plans to fight the decision. He's coming up with Webster. But first, do our universities get their share of the financial pie? BC is the only province that has not increased its operating grants in the past two years. In the studio with Webster, Dr. David Strangway, president of UBC, and Dr. William Saywell, president of Simon Fraser University. I always say if you're going to have one university president, you might as well have two university presidents. Now, gentlemen, it's really open season for you to tell me what you need to bring our universities back to that statute of which you used to be so proud. Well, first of all, to you, David Strangway, do you concede that your standards have fallen off because of financial hardships? I do not concede that our standards have fallen off. I do concede that we're having a rough time keeping up the competition, Jack. The uh, universities all across North America are raising salaries, are recognizing the importance of universities. And what we're facing with now is a very hot competitive North American market. Well, are you losing people? We're losing people, but uh, we're also keeping some of the good ones, and uh, what we need to do is to ensure that we have the ability to keep the rest of the good ones and attract the new ones. Now, let's get the same, uh, let's put the same question to Dr. William Saywell of SFU. Well, Jack, uh, Simon Fraser University's uh, admission standards are among the highest in the country, but uh, there's no question that in the last four or five years, the quality uh, of uh, the education that we uh, provide uh, has been under uh, very, very difficult circumstances. We don't have the same level of uh, books in our libraries or we don't have the same access to teaching assistance and uh, special help and so on that uh, we once did in, in the universities of British Columbia. So in that sense, I think we've all, uh, we've all suffered. So therefore, what you need is more money. You got it, Jack. Well, all we right. need something before that. And I think uh, as I read the situation today, I think we're getting it. I think before more money, you need a change in attitude, a more supportive attitude to education and higher education. Yes. And I see that. I see it in the public, and uh, I see it uh, in our elected officials. So I'm, uh, I'm fairly uh, upbeat. In other words, you feel that education has taken the kicking, a little bit of a kicking that perhaps it had to date, take to make it kind of streamline its procedures. Well, there's a lot of ways of looking at that. We've been through tough times. The province has been through tough times, and the universities have carried a significant share of that. And I think that that's important, and uh, we've, we, we've, we've done that. I think the issue as we look ahead, though, is, uh, is, is not to look at the kicking aspect, but to look at the positive aspect. We have a lot to contribute to the economy of the province. We have a lot to contribute towards the knowledge-based society that we're moving into. Well, that and sounds a lot great. to contribute to students. So. Let me put to you some of the little facts I have corrected here, collected here, and you can tell me. One, we have the worst student aid program in Canada for universities. True or false? Well, it is true in the sense that we do not provide a grant now to, uh, to students. And uh, I think David and I have both been pushing the government to reconsider that. It is reconsidering it, and I hope it yes. will do so positively. Because that means, surely, when we have the worst student grant aid, 66 per student, $66, the average across the country nearly $700, that means that universities in BC are becoming havens, are becoming institutions for the wealthier kids. Well, I agree with Bill. We've got to work hard to get that student grant up. But do you agree uh, with me that in this particular climate, it means that only those who've got family money can get a university? I agree that that's the direction we're moving very rapidly. Well, I think there's, and I think, yes. th David, there's some statistical evidence to support that, because in the last three or four years, there has been a sharp decrease in enrollment 
from <coughs> places outside of the greater metropolitan areas of Vancouver and Victoria. Yes. Uh, uh, young people in the hinterland are having, uh, in the hinterland, I mean in the interior, small towns, which cost more to come to Vancouver and Victoria, are coming in fewer numbers. Than so it's areas. becoming more exclusive for those who are lucky enough to live within reach of our major universities on the mainland and, and in those, Victoria. And those who can live at home and attend university are, are in much better condition than those who cannot live at home. Surely and that's university. intolerably unfair and discrimination. Well, I, I, I think so. I think it's undesirable in, in every way for the future development of this province, whether you're talking about culturally or economically or whatnot. And I, I'm, I'm persuaded that our new minister has, uh, has listened to this issue and uh, has put together a committee that's looking into it, and I think that there will be a very positive change coming forward. I'm counting on it. All right, now, Stats Canada tells me that the national figure for attending post-secondary institutions in this country between 18 and 24 is 23 percent, but in B.C., only 16.5 percent. And that's a tragedy for British Columbia because, as I say, with the kind of economy and the kind of society we're moving into, we must have more of our young people attending and participating in universities. Is there any indication you're going to get more money? And if you get it, what will you primarily do with it? Well, uh, there's a lot of things we need to do. As I say, we need to regain the competitive edge. We need to be sure that our best faculty members remain. We need to be sure we have laboratory facilities. We need to be sure we have the good library books and all of those kinds of things so that those people can, in fact, have access to the, uh, to the modern techniques and the modern tools. Are so we that far behind, though? I mean, I thought universities were universities, and if you have laboratory techniques, you've got them forever. The equipment outdates very fast in the kind of times that we're in. Uh, new computers, uh, computer stations, computer terminals, uh, just to pick, pick one example, but perhaps in uh, some of the, the, the life sciences, the, even the modern microscopes or electron microscopes have to be used now by undergraduates and by students who are learning how to do these things. Mm -hmm. So always there's new techniques, new methods, new facilities coming on stream, and we have to be able to put our students in front of those instruments so that they can understand how to use them. What's the budget for SFU? About oh. 80, 80 million. 80 million. And for UBC? We're about 220 million. And how much do you want to see it go up? Will it go up at all this year? Have you any indications about increased grants? Although I thought most of the money came from the feds through the provincial government. We have no indication yet as to what the, what the grants are going to be for the coming year. We're certainly in deep discussions. We are documenting our case and we have submitted our, uh, our demands and our needs as to what we think is necessary to keep the universities at the, at the level that we believe they must be at. Who decides the allocation from universities? What do you call that? Well, the University's Council, Council technically takes the, I say technically, it has by statute the authority of taking the grant that the government decides on and then making an allocative decision amongst the three universities. Uh, I said technically because in the last few years where there have been uh, cutbacks, uh, uh, really it's just flowed through historical um, uh, ratios. Except when, wasn't there some holdback of uh, certain funds in McGeer's day? which put pressure on you to do certain types of education? There are holdbacks of very small amounts of funds uh, to put certain kinds of pressures on. But I think the point that, uh, that Bill is making is the decision is basically made at Cabinet, and uh, clearly they have to decide at that level what the priorities are they're going to put on the, on the university's need and the, and the case that we're making. All right, and SFU, given the proper money, <coughs> what new directions will you be taking in terms of education, uh, tuition at your university? In case of tuition? No, new directions will you take, teaching? Oh, well, we've, uh, we've set ourselves on a course which I think is, uh, is uh, basically uh, well directed uh, towards protecting the core disciplines that are always at the essence of the university, the humanities, the basic sciences, and so on. We've developed on top of those some interdisciplinary programs. We're trying to develop niches that are different and complementary to uh, our sister institutions, areas such as engineering science, uh, gerontology, uh, criminology, and so on. So we, our, our roadmap is well marked out. We're not going to vary dramatically from How it. about your roadmap? Well, we're doing a lot of the similar kinds of things. We, again, recognize the things that are done at, uh, at SFU and uh, are picking I mean, the areas that we you have our I mean, you don't tread on each other's ground, do you? Well, no, we don't tread on each other's ground, except, as Bill said, there's the core subjects. All of us must have English. All of us must have French or history or mathematics or physics and so on. So the main part of universities, in fact, has a similarity at any university, wherever you go. Uh, there are special things then you add on top of that. We have a medical school, for example, mm -hmm. where we're looking at a lot of the new techniques in medicine. We look a lot at the fields of biotechnology or Pacific Rim studies and, and so on. So there are a whole lot of things that we, we do that have particular focus to them. 
but the bulk of what's done at a university, in fact, in terms of teaching, has a lot of commonality from one university to another. When you talk about your 80 million and your 200 million, what are you looking for? An extra 10 million? On the whole system? Yeah. No, more than that, because then you have the U of uh, Vic on top of that, so you're about 370 million, I think, in the yeah. total system. Uh, we recognize, I think everybody in the universities recognize that the financial situation in British Columbia is still a difficult one. We realize that the catch-up to get back into where we think we should be in this country cannot be done in a single year. But we hope for a good start on it this year. We hope for money that will allow us to begin salary restoration so it will make us competitive. We hope for additional money for equipment and so on so that we can be begin the restoration. But it's a beginning. It'll take more than one That's year right. to do it. Same for you. Same for us. In fact, our proposals have been submitted this year jointly by the three universities, which we think is a, is a very important step. And those proposals are put together, and we have, in fact, mapped out a plan as to how to get into the recovery situation. Well, gentlemen, class will come to order, and we shall now take <laughs> questions to you from our fairly large uh, <laughs> what's it called? enrollment yes. on That's BCTV. Right. After the break. <laughs> Dr. Strangway from UBC, Dr. Saywell from SFU. Oh, you both seem to be quite confident, but you can't just put your hands out and get everything you want, can you? Not with a billion dollar operating deficit in the province last year. One billion dollars. As I said, change in attitude, change in priorities, and the beginning of a change in funding is what we're after. But we should borrow to fund our universities if we don't get enough from the feds in the province, eh? In fact, if you think about where this province is heading, think about the, uh, the, the subjects and the disciplines that are coming up, you have to recognize that the universities are going to play the key role in the, coming, in the coming decade. In fact, for the rest of this century, it is what we do that's going to count for this province. Well, let's try these calls. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Could you uh, get them to compare the tuition fees in, at UBC with uh, tuition fees in uh, Ontario, for instance, at King's University? Could you get them to... Uh, comment on the uh, Fraser Institute report about poor people subsidizing wealthy people's education? I'm not aware of that one, but they may be. What about tuition fees between here and the rest of the country? We're Ontario. highest in the country. We're highest in the country now for the basic arts and science programs with one or two exceptions, uh, and we're higher than Ontario. Yes. And David, in, in some of the professional faculties, you're even higher than that. And our professional faculties are quite a bit higher than the others. Uh, I think, in fairness, in the other areas, we're, when we say we're higher, we're maybe 10% higher or 15% higher. We're so not we're dramatically higher, but higher we are higher. Higher in tuition fee and yes. the lowest in grants and aid. Is that correct? You got it. I mean, that makes it a double whammy against that's the student a, that's here. That's a double whammy. Plus the, in, the interior expense of coming from the interior, that makes it a triple whammy. It's really the cost of living away from home is, uh, is, is, the, is the big deterrent. Go ahead, please. Hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. Yeah. The two gentlemen from back east maybe don't realize that here in BC, everyone keeps telling us we're very different. We have a frontier mentality at work. It's the government of self-made men, and I stress the fact men. And that's why you're not going to see education as a priority with these people. I, I mean, last week we see the provincial secretary. Where does he go to get his diplomas? He goes to a diploma mill down in San Jose, California, and now he has something called an MBA from some Columbia Pacific. Well, uh, oh, fair oh. enough. He's You're not going to get a change in attitude when you have these kind of people running the government, Mr. Webster. Let's not be fooling people. Let's get to the point here. Well, let's see if they'll come to the point with you. I think I see already a remarkable change in attitude. We have many members from the government coming to talk about economic development and to talk about the needs, to talk about uh, computer science activities and uh, the infrastructures that are necessary to support those activities. So I think there is a changing attitude, and uh, whether they have or have not been to university, my impression is quite clear that they are recognizing the need and the broad roles that we play in our society. Well, I just want to leave with one thing. Dr. Howard Pesch from the University of Victoria three years ago said exactly the same thing. And he said we were training a generation of waiters and waitresses in this province to help out the service sector. The service sector has become the big bugaboo with the people in power in Victoria, the tourist industry. Here, here. Waiters and waitresses. Here, here. Let's get I, to the point here. I agree with you on that, but we don't want to produce a generation of waiters and waitresses and minimum wage service people, which might well be our future if we don't look to our universities and give the kids of BC a chance to get a first-class education here. here. 
How does that for a little speech? They're very sounds, good speech. Sounds very good, Jack. I mean, I have this recurring nightmare that if the uh, world trade keeps the same, we'll finish up selling lots of tickets. <laughs> I'm working as waiters and waitresses. Well, you're describing trying to get our funding each year. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead from Vanland, B.C. Yes, Jack. I'm uh, a grade 12 student this year from Vernon. And um, I'd just like to point out the fact that um, even going to, uh, Vernon, um, to Alberta, the tuition fees are twice as high. For example, going to um, a university in Alberta, it's 866 a year, or at UBC, it's 1320. How are we? How are the, the leaders of tomorrow supposed to go on um, living when we have to pay double as much to go to to go to BC University? When that uh, when that message from young people, particularly outside of Vancouver and Victoria, and their parents and their friends, gets to our legislators, directly to our MLAs and so on, we're going to be more effectively heard. I would urge the caller to to make exactly that point with his elected official. He's telling me that his Alberta fees would be $868 and his UBC fees would be $1,300. Is and that right, caller? An American student has to pay $2,000 more to come to a British Columbia University than he does to an Alberta uni University. We're just killing ourselves. Um, well, I don't quite get what's bad about that. What's bad uh, about the American gentleman yeah. having to pay $2,000? Yeah, I'm less concerned about the American it's, student It pay, just doesn't seem high. fair that yes. we have to pay more for fees when it's, you know. Well, that's, that, that's the issue, and I agree with you. That was a good call. Go ahead, please. Oh. Yes. Yes, uh, I would like to talk to Dr. Saywell and ask him what is being done with all the people that were forced to drop out of SFU in, a, in around the 82, 83 times, and what is being done to get these people back into university. I'm Sorry, not me. I didn't do that. Are you there? Twish. Oh, no. Carry on. I'm a waiter at the time. I missed you. Give me that again. What's been done for all these people forced to drop out of SFU in 82, 83? Right. That have, uh, well, in the last three or four years, and what is going to be done in, say, getting these people back in, people that have been, been out and went and trained themselves to be in a... Does that question make any sense to you, Dr. Saywell? Uh, is he referring to students, or are you referring to employees? Students. To students. To students. Right and what is being done to get these people back into the system. Well, we've had a sharp uh, increase uh, in enrollment this, this, past, uh, this past fall, and we think some of these people have now found a means of, of coming back. Uh, to reiterate what I said earlier, I think one of the, the most important ways of, of bringing them back is to, uh, is to reintroduce the grant program in, in the student aid package. We uh, are spending in terms of our own operating grant, as high a percentage on student aid as, as we can. But uh, in other words, uh, we, we, we see some signs of them returning, and I think that the restoration of the student grant program would do a lot to assist that. The student loan programs are still in effect, aren't they? Yes, student loan programs, but they mount up very fast when you have to take care not only of tuition, but books and living costs and housing and food and everything else, and uh, clothes and all the things that you need just to get by. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. I have a couple of questions. First, for the president of uh, UBC, why is it you have 151 courses in history, 131 in English, 90 some odd in sociology, and you can go on and on. You've got a course history 441, which is anti-Semitism since, since 1948, and you brought in Dr. Michael Cohen from Israel to teach it. I'm talking about the way you people squander money. Now, for Simon Fraser, I got a couple for you. Just a minute. <laughs> hold on, hold on. What about you, Dr. Strangway, first? I think I've received a letter from you, and I think you were at one point pointed out to me that our courses in wrestling should be in the drama program, if I remember correctly. That's right. <laughs> so I, all I can say is that there is a large demand for those courses in history, and we have a lot of students, and they're in there taking those courses. So okay, now uh, for Dr. Saywell. <laughs> Dr. Saywell, you've got five courses in uh, history in Western Canada that are a complete overlap. You, I have attended courses in your university where the instructor said, I like to teach at night as well, and I need at least eight <coughs> students before I can teach at night. And so she divided the course so she could teach at night and pick up her extra money. That same instructor is teaching at UBC and Simon Fraser. 
Well, and good, you good. take a look at how you're squandering your money before you get your hand in my pocket. She's, okay. She's, she sounds very entrepreneurial to me, but... Uh, Does that sound <laughs> a, a legitimate complaint to you? I would look forward to receiving a letter from him with more details. I'm not going to comment on that. You'd either. look into it. Okay. <laughs> go ahead from Prince George. No, I'm calling from Terrace, B.C. Terrace, go ahead. My concern is with the North. I appreciate the fact that you're addressing these issues, but what's going to be done? You know, we are, we're discriminated against when it comes to the fact that we have to go down for early registration if we want to get the courses we want. Do you have any idea how much that costs? We've got a pretty fair idea what it costs, and uh, I think that's the kind of issue that we need to, we need to be looking at uh, pretty carefully. I think the whole issue of access to the universities by people from the interior and the North is, uh, is something that's very much on a lot of our minds. There's nothing special planned that you know of or that you gentlemen can do to help people from the interior other than what's in place in the way of loans. We think grant programs is, is the way to go. We are looking to a new registration system, by the way, beginning to develop it, and within, within the next few months we'll have a, a, a better way of dealing with the kinds of questions that the caller, uh, caller made. Bill, well, I was going to make exactly the same point. We, too, are attempting to improve our registration system for the convenience of those uh, out of the greater metropolitan areas. Uh, but there's one other point, and that is that the three universities, uh, public universities in British Columbia, cooperate uh, in terms of our distance education programs uh, through uh, the Open Learning Institute and, and so on. So uh, the, the, the universities and the university presidents are, are supporting uh, those, those initiatives. Good. So it'll be tough times ahead for you until you know how much money you're going to get through the provincial government from the federal government plus any increases. When will you know? We only hope this year, Jack, that we'll know before the beginning of the fiscal year, which is April 1. <laughs> we usually Same know several months after the Amen, fiscal year I starts. So how can you plan if you don't know before your new <laughs> year begins? You're saying, please, Mr. Cuv Cuvalier, give us our budgetary money by the, before the 1st of April. You've got it. you got it. My thanks to Dr. David Strang Strangway from UBC and to Dr. Saywell from SFU. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Little bite at the cherry. <laughs> Next day, uh, something different after the break. <laughs> I didn't know whether to laugh or cry when I saw the details of a matter that was up in front of the BC Council of Human Rights. Now, here is Jim Mercier of Production Supply Company Limited. It's a small business. You have about, what, 10 employees? That's correct, in British Columbia. Yeah. Now, tell me what happened when one of your staff interviewed a woman for a clerical job. Well, uh, surprisingly, my office manager uh, interviewed uh, several applicants, and, and uh, the, the lady in question, uh, uh, when she was interviewed, uh, she kept her coat on during the, the interview, which in hindsight seemed a bit odd, but at the time didn't. Uh, my office manager uh, phoned her up and said she was the successful applicant, offered her the job as, as a secretary in our office, and uh, <laughs> at that time, the, the lady involved uh, said that uh, she had basically a little problem. She had to tell her that, that she was pregnant and uh, that uh, she would have to leave in six weeks' time and take something like three to four months off. Maternity leave. Maternity leave. Uh, my office manager explained to her that we were a very small company and we had uh, four ladies that worked in the office and basically they each had their own jobs and you don't have a lot of overlap and uh, that we just couldn't handle it. We just couldn't do it. Uh, so, so that uh, did your office manager then say that now you haven't got the job? Well, I guess she originally offered it to her, and, and when uh, the woman uh, explained her circumstances, she never really accepted. So we never hired her as such. So it wasn't a matter of saying she didn't. They both agreed that it it would be a problem. Anyway, when, when she was phoned up and offered the job, she said, "Fine, but uh, I got to tell you, I'm going to have to be off in what six weeks." That's correct. Turned out she was what within six weeks of within the birth of a child. That's correct. Now, she took you in front of the BC Council on Human Rights. What happened? Well, prior to that, uh, or, or at least when that happened, uh, we had a, a chap come around from the council whom I've dealt with in the past and is a very reasonable, responsible guy. And he basically explained that uh, we couldn't win and, and that he suggested that I should pay a sum, I think it was $1,000, to this woman, uh, basically to get rid of her. Right? And I said, but I've done nothing wrong. You know, we, we, uh, we wouldn't hire anybody. It wasn't her because she was a woman or pregnant or anything else. That uh, anybody who came in and said that, uh, you know, uh, six weeks later, I'm, I want four months off, uh, we just couldn't handle that in a very small company like ours. So 
uh, that, of course, went to the next step, and then I appeared uh, in front of a, a commissioner from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, he heard the whole story, and uh, the long and the short of it is basically found against us, and uh, we now have to pay a, a $3,600 penalty for uh, uh, violating this person's rights. No, that's for not hiring her six weeks before she would require three or four months maternity leave. That's correct. So she gets an award of 3600 That's correct. Let me ask you this question. <clears throat> Are you entitled as an employer under the BC Human Rights Act to ask a woman if she's pregnant? Not to my knowledge. I would think that if you asked her if she was pregnant, uh, it would be the same as asking if she was married or whatever. You'd probably be violating her, her rights. Yeah, so I, so if, we couldn't ask. And if you did ask, mind you, if a woman was not not noticeably pregnant, surely you could say to her, when are you going to have the baby? I would bet you couldn't even say that, quite frankly. Oh, I suppose because if she was not chosen from among the applicants, she would then have a kind of, on the face of it, the right to go to human rights and say, I didn't get the job because I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Ipso facto, that's discrimination. Jack, if I was uh, a pregnant woman in British Columbia right now, I dare say I'd be out applying for every job in town because every time I got turned down, I'd have a potential case. And if most employers uh, accept the chap, uh, the, the employee of the Human Rights Commission, who suggests, look, you know, you, you don't need the hassle, pay her off and forget it, it could be a pretty lucrative career. Well, what do you feel about it now? Are you going to you're going to pay the thirty six hundred dollars and fade into the mists? No, uh, I guess I've I've never taken the easy way. Uh, no, I've instructed my lawyers to uh, my lawyer happens to be a lady, I might add, uh, to uh, appeal this, uh, which has to go uh, to a, a, a justice of the Supreme Court, as I understand. Judicial it. review. Judicial review. That's correct, and uh, which uh, if I win will probably cost me six to ten thousand dollars. Of course, if I lose, it'll cost you the six to ten plus the original thirty-six. <coughs> it's quite astonishing. I want to get that quite right so nobody misunderstands. Your office manager interviews a woman, yes. right? And she seems to be suitable for the job. Yes. So the applicant leaves the office, and your office manager phones and says, you're the successful applicant. The woman says, fine, thank you very much. Right. But uh, something I've got to tell you. Correct. I'm pregnant, and I'm going to have a baby in six weeks' time, and I'll need maternity leave. I'm not sure she said well, six weeks, but there was a what, time on it. Well, yeah. to that effect. <clears throat> yeah. So your office manager then withdrew the offer of the job. Correct. And because of that, you were taken up in front of the BC Human Rights Council and fined $3,600. That's correct. Is it possible for a small business like man like you, what do, what do you think uh, would be the right way to handle this in future? Well, I think everybody's entitled to, you know, under our system, if, if the law is there, that they're entitled to, to raise the point. Uh, I think that it's, it's a difficult time. There's no question that in the past women were discriminated against and so on. But I think the pendulum has probably swung a little too far in the other direction, that every time you turn around, it seems, that you're, you're violating somebody's rights. And um, our company uh, supplies the mining industry in, in uh, Western Canada, and as such, we haven't made a profit since 1981. Now, 1981 was a great year, but since then it's been pretty damn tough. And our employees uh, just went through a, a salary cut in September, uh, ranging from 10 to 20 percent, higher for myself, I might add. My salary is almost nil now, uh, trying to just survive. And, and when you come along with something like this, it's darn tough. I don't have an easy answer for it. I appreciate that. I mean, that you, you don't want in any way, shape, or form to, to discriminate. Well, but it doesn't seem fair to me. It isn't fair. And if, a a if a potential employee has an impediment which is going to cut into the start of the job, surely they must, in honor bound, tell you about it so you can make a rational decision. Well, you know, it's funny that when I appeared uh, before the uh, commissioner, I, I explained to him the previous occupant of the job was a pregnant woman, which happened to be a bit of a coincidence. She left because her husband was transferred, and had she have stayed there, I guess we would have done fulfilled our obligation. And, uh, anyway, anyway, Jim Mercier, a production, name of the company again, Production Supply Company Limited, you're going to fight it? Yes. Uh, calls to Jim Mercier after the break. This is a man who's been ordered by the BC Human Council of Human Rights to pay an unsuccessful job applicant $3,600. Mm -hmm. 
from not hiring out six weeks or so before she would have given birth to a child and required maternity leave. Go ahead to Jim Mercier, please. Yes, Mr. Mercier, I think that you have just been absolutely criminally treated. I think that just because you were good enough to interview people for a job that you did have, that you should have the stipulation to say that these people were fit and capable of doing the job. And that means physically fit. I think this woman is very wrong, and believe me, this is really, the law is an ass. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. That she wasn't thinks, my mother, either. No, she <laughs> thinks the council of the decision of the council is wrong. That's what she thinks. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Yes. This just shows you, you know, small business or even medium-sized businesses are having a very tough time in this day and age, and then you get decisions like this. It is absolutely unbelievable. It's time that action was taken to correct this. An employer has got to have some rights, and that right is to hire who he wishes, when he wishes, and if they don't meet the, the, all the standards that are there and they're not on the payroll and they haven't started work, then to me that employee doesn't have any rights until that, that time starts. Thank you. But you would agree that you would not be entitled to discriminate on the grounds of male or female, black, white, or whatever. We happen to have a couple of East Indian people in the ten, uh, one now, one, one left for another job, and, and one Chinese person and several women, and you know, we just don't discriminate, period. If people get hired on their capability do of you, doing the job. Do you feel as if you have discriminated in this case at all? No, not at all. She was treated the same way anybody who wanted four months off after six weeks' work would be treated. On the day she was told she could stop. Exactly. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm a little bit interested to uh, make note of a comment that was uh, passed by one of the members of the board, that in this case women seem to have a disadvantage to men uh, under <clears throat> the hiring uh, policies or whatever that were used, and I find that a bit ambiguous because uh, it doesn't really relate to what the situation is. I don't quite understand you. Well, he made a statement, I forget the name of the individual, but it's in the press today, mm -hmm. it's in the uh, Sun today, that uh, his findings, uh, whoever was on the board, his findings oh, yes. were based I've got it here. If, if women who are pregnant are not to be treated as full and equal human beings, women as a class are not equal and that are on an inferior footing in the workforce. Well, yeah. there's something to the effect that, uh, that he related to men, which seemed to me to be kind of ambiguous because okay. it wasn't really the issue. Anyway, I gather you're with Mr. Mr. Mercy and his position. Very definitely. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm glad to see he's taking this lady to court, but I just wonder if it's going to cost him six to $10,000 to, to do this, is it going to cost her just as much to defend herself, or does she also have the right to yeah. uh, a free lawyer? Well, she doesn't have to defend herself. So you give me that. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I found it kind of unusual at the, the hearing that I went to that she was represented by a legal aid lawyer. And I thought, you know, my taxes go to pay that, and here I am. Uh, I went unrepresented because I couldn't justify the cost of a lawyer at that level. Naturally, I will have one here. I don't think it's a matter she defends here. It's before the court. And I guess she would appear as a witness, possibly. Oh, no, I don't no, know. No, the Council of Human Rights will, will, I presume, yes. will take her case I'm because sure. they ruled against you in the first place. But I will pay for it out of my own pocket. I don't have a Council of Business Rights or whatever to pay my bills. Maybe you should have. That would be nice, yeah. Go ahead, please. That me? Yes, you. That's not exactly human rights, but it's something to do with a, a woman and the law. <coughs> I was ordered by a court register to pay a, a, a common law spouse maintenance. And he said, it won't be so bad because you'll get it back on income tax. So I went ahead and paid it for two years. And I, get, I just got a notice the other day from the income tax people. I now have to pay income tax on all that money I paid her. In other words, it's not a deductible expense because there wasn't a signed legal agreement. Right. Oh, it was, it, was a, it was through the court. But the, apparently the only place in Canada that you can pay a common law spouse maintenance and, and, and claim income tax is Ontario. Thanks for the information, sir. We didn't know that. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Mercier, I am a woman of childbearing age working in the public service, and I sincerely hope you win your appeal. I think it's criminal what she's done. She did it with full knowledge, and I know the type of money you have to pay out to train these people. Thank you I very just much. want you to know that I am with you all the way. I disagree totally with these human rights. They've gone too far. They've given you absolutely nothing anymore. Employers might as well 
I don't, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm incensed at it, and I sincerely apologize on behalf of all my sex. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I think the lady uh, that asked for the job uh, asked for it under false pretenses because if she would have known she was pregnant she, at the time of the interview, she should have told him. And he could have told her that I have other applicants to interview and that he would l let her know in a few days or whatever. And I think human rights is not right anymore. But I'll bet you this, uh, Jim Mercier, if you had said to an applicant, I am not going to hire you because you are within six weeks or seven weeks of giving birth, that you'd have been guilty of discrimination under the BC Council, under the Human Rights Act of BC. I would expect, given the way this case has turned out so far, that yes, that's exactly what would happen. What would you do the next time you were hiring a woman? Would you say to her, uh, are you pregnant? No. Oh, I can't say that, no. I can't ask if she's married or pregnant or, or you know, any other things that one might ask. Uh, I don't know whether you do a profile test as they walk in the office or something. It, it, it's just not right. It's, as it's, it's as a problem. As far as a disability is concerned, I think you can only ask about uh, an obvious dif disability which might interfere with the duties of the job. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I, I don't have any problem uh, if someone you call no. a disability and you can hire them that way. It's only a matter of if you're not going to be there at all. That's a little tough to deal with. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hello, is that me? Yes. I, I am so upset over this whole issue. I can hardly speak. I'm so enraged. I'm with him 100%. I hope he wins, but I wish there was some sort of um, money he could take from this woman uh, just to pay it no, back. No, 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 no. Keep your perspective. The woman uh, exercised her rights yeah. under the Human Rights Act. She's entitled. And she's entitled. And you can't say she did anything wrong. She was supported by the Council on Human Rights after a proper hearing. It's a question of now whether Jimmy's prepared to go all whole hog on an appeal. That's correct. Maybe the Council of Small Business, if there is such a thing, should help you with this appeal. That would be nice, yeah. Good. Where am I going now? It's 6444. Abbotsford, go ahead, please. Yes, I think the woman obviously didn't have any scruples at all to be able to do a thing like that. Furthermore, I, I myself am out of work. Uh, I'm fat and 40-ish, or approaching 40, and it is absolutely, um, it's been very difficult for me to get a job because there is discrimination against my weight. Fat and lazy seem to go together. But it would be an absolutely <laughs> impossible for me as a human being to be able to pursue that sort of thing as, as discrimination in the court, even that it, it be, you know, it is discrimination, uh, but it would be ridiculous to pursue it. Thank you. You haven't had to say a word in your own defense tonight no, so it's far. kind of nice. Go ahead from, where is it? Not that one. Go ahead from Cumberland. Hello. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you, ma'am. Go ahead. You're on the air. I can talk right now? Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is, uh, hello? I just wanted to talk to Mr. Mercier. Yes? I'm here. He's here, and you put down your television set, and I shall cut you off. Okay. All right. It's and off. hurry up about it. Okay. I'm just wondering, <laughs> is there, don't, don't you ask questions on the preliminary uh, interview as to their health, I meant, or any impediments that they may have? No, you're not. I don't I'm believe. not defending anybody, or I'm not against anybody one way or another i'm just wondering do you not ask any certain questions with regard to their health I no no we don't and i don't believe we're entitled to ask i guess some firms have a medical that is they hire you subject to a medical which uh, in larger companies may be the case in a company our size i don't think that would ever happen no but surely you must be entitled to ask in the case of an obvious pregnancy when are you going to have the baby well uh, I, I would say not. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I, I just know that we didn't ask anything and we still ended up on the wrong end. So. You don't have to pay the $3,600 yet anyway, do you? Well, I expect I do have to pay it at least into court. I'm not just sure what the legality is since we're appealing it, whether we have to pay so it you will now or. you will now have a full dress hearing in front of a judicial review of a Supreme Court judge of British Columbia to find out if you were in fact wrong or if common sense can win the day. I believe that's the way it works, and it would be nice to think that common sense would win the day, but given the, the first part of this thing, I'm not sure that's the case, but you have to try. My thanks and sympathy to Jim Mercier of Production Supplies Limited in his battle against the $3,600 judgment for not hiring the woman who, when she was offered the job, said, by the way, I'll need some time off. I'm going to have a baby in six weeks. Thank you, James. Thank you, Jack. I'll be back after the break.
after screaming and shouting at the man, what was his name again, Steve? Ian no, Ian McPhail from the International Fund for Animal Welfare last week. Uh, I felt I had to ask Michael Hunter, the president of the Fisheries Council of British Columbia, to make a little appearance on the other side of the coin. Uh, the man from animal welfare is a man who is threatening Canada with a total boycott of Canadian fish, canned fish, if uh, Canada dares to start the seal hunt again. Now, Mr. Hunter, didn't these um, IFAW people and Greenpeace and the other people do this to us a few years ago? Yes, they did, Jack, uh, in 1983, uh, at the time when the, the seal hunt was still going on. Uh, the uh, campaign that they conducted mostly in Europe and in the UK uh, was successful to the point that one major supermarket chain lifted Canadian canned salmon from its shelf. And, uh, you know, you mentioned it's a boycott against Canadian fish that they're trying to impose. Uh, the fact is in England that the only identifiable Canadian product happens to be Canadian canned salmon from the West Coast, far distant from where the seals are, were being harvested. Now, which was the British chain that banned the sale of... It was Tesco. Tesco. Mm -hmm. So that means instead of our, and was it an effective boycott? Well, it was effective to the point that uh, Tesco, uh, whatever market share they have in the UK, uh, did not list Canadian salmon for over a year. Uh, so consumers were forced to buy uh, salmon from competing suppliers like the US and the USSR. Yeah, John West salmon, the Russian salmon. I always mm -hmm. remember that as a That's kid right. in the old country. Absolutely. So therefore, it did do some damage to us, that boycott. Yes, it did. Now. What, uh, what do you know of their vast mailing campaign? Um, they've sent out half a million, I believe, letters, newsletters, directly to BC fish processors. Yeah, w what I've seen, Jack, is a letter which uh, you have from Brian Davis, the founder of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, dated October 86, uh, which uh, accompanied with that was a, a pre-addressed postcard uh, to the presidents of the member companies of our council. Uh, which essentially said, uh, if the Canadian government subsidizes a new seal hunt, we'll boycott your products. <coughs> and these were available to every recipient of this letter to mail. And uh, up to this point, our member companies have received about 56,000 pieces of correspondence. 57,808, the okay. grand total. Now, th this is the campaign, the propaganda campaign, backed by the IFAW, Brian Davies' founder. Mm -hmm. And where did the letters come from? You have a breakdown. Yeah, we've got about uh, 24,000 from the USA, about 22,000 from uh, Great Britain, and uh, 7,000 from other places, which is basically Europe, plus I think about 3,600 or so from Canada. From Canada, but that's a lot of letters. If you send out a half a million mailer and you get 10% of the people to send in the protest, that's very successful, you, is it not? You're doing extraordinarily well. Now, the seal hunt hasn't actually, first, we haven't killed any white coats since, what, 1982? 1982, 1982, I believe. 1982. Mm -hmm. And are we still waiting for the results of the Maloof Commission? Uh, yes, we are, uh, you and I. I believe that uh, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans has had that report on his desk for some time now, uh, but I am not aware of what it says. Uh, this letter from Mr. Davis uh, suggests that uh, the report contains a recommendation that the Canadian government subsidize a new seal harvest. Uh, I can't get anybody to confirm that. And I think it would be uh, very strange if that were the case. Uh, as far as I can tell, the issue uh, uh, ought to be decided anyway on the, the merits of the case. Uh, it's now, very when they talk about the, a new seal harvest, surely there's nothing wrong with harvesting adult harp seals. Well, I, uh, I don't think so, uh, Jack. I think that uh, what Mr. Sidden uh, has to do as minister is to uh, make a decision on how to best use Canadian resources. Uh, what concerns us is that if he has to make a decision, if the evidence suggests that there is a, a reason for a seal harvest, uh, if it's for economic reasons for the landsman in Newfoundland or, or the Inuit, uh, it's our products which are allegedly are going to pay the price, at least if the IFAW gets its way. Uh, I don't think that's right, and I don't think it's right that Mr. Sidden have his uh, resource management responsibilities constrained by some uh, some activities like this. I noticed too, it's quite incredible that the campaign, the campaign in Britain of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, Save the Seals, cost them 360,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. That's 750,000 dollars. And they say supermarket groups drowning under a deluge of postcards have bowed to the pressure. Letters and postcards did it then and they can do it now. 
and this is in October 86, have you been able to launch any anti-IFAW campaign against uh, these people in the United Kingdom? No, Jack, we, we haven't, and I, you know, you talk about those kind of dollars, uh, and probably more, it's, uh, it's not the kind of thing you want to spend a lot of money on. Uh, what we would like to see done is for the, uh, the Government of Canada and the taxpayer uh, to, uh, to pay for a, a public campaign against commercial terrorism, and that's what this is. It's as offensive to me as the kind of terrorism we hear about on the news every night, and uh, I think for two reasons. One, I think that we are innocent in this. Uh, we need some protection, and secondly, I think that the Government of Canada owes itself uh, the right to make a rational decision on resource management without this kind of uh, campaign going you on. You would call this international economic terrorism? Yes, I would. And I think uh, the only way you fight fire is with fire. And I think it's, it's not fair to have Canadian diplomats and trade commercial officers abroad uh, asked to deal with this kind of thing. I think uh, that's not what they're there for. It's not what they're trained to do. And I believe it would be appropriate for uh, the Minister for the Government of Canada to hire a, a professional PR firm to counter this. Has Sidden Dunn taken any action on it yet at well, all? I uh, wrote to him uh, on behalf of our members who have been receiving all this correspondence uh, about three weeks ago, and I haven't had a, a reply of any sort to this point. This is what I object to, uh, the prospect of the ceiling starting again. Uh, first of all, it says the report is said to recommend that a government subsidize a renewed mass slaughter of 75,000 uh, seals a year with hunters concentrating on animals of more than two weeks of age. He's got no idea if that's true or false, and it's likely false. Unless he's got better sources than I do, Jack. You're absolutely right. The sealers are ecstatic. It's a bunch of garbage that they do. Yeah. Sid, mind you, it would be tough for Sid to mount a campaign, but he could do it in Britain, couldn't he? Well, I think so. How's our salmon pack this year? Uh, it's uh, approximately two million cases, Jack, which is uh, slightly ahead, in fact, of last year, which was uh, a record year for salmon harvest this century. And we're hoping that the two million cases will go like wildfire when they're marketed in Britain and throughout Europe. That's very important to us, yes. My thank you to tell your relatives in Britain not to fall for any of this garbage from Brian Davies and his cohorts. Michael Hunter, my thanks to Michael Hunter, President, Fisheries Council of British Columbia. Thanks, Mike. Thank and you. I'll be back playing hockey after the break. Remember the puck, the flagpole, and the hockey stick from Expo? We've been given it, we, BC, have been given it in the present for note by the feds. And here's Ted Rutledge of the Webster Show to tell you what's going to happen to the puck, the flagpole, and the shtick. If I were to ask you what's the single most expensive piece of hockey equipment in BC, you'd be right if you said the Pacific Coliseum. But what about the second most expensive? This is it. It's up for grabs to any community that can stick handle a deal. This 62 and a half meter, one of a kind item now belongs to the people of British Columbia, and the provincial government is handling the negotiations for the sale or acquisition. Uh, believe it or not, Ted, there's tremendous competition from across Canada from people who wanted the, this uh, hockey stick and hockey puck and. Uh, uh, even interest in it as far down as, as, as Georgia and the United States uh, as from, a, from a news point of view. But uh, uh, we felt that it should stay in British Columbia. There are several communities actively working on plans. In fact, one of them has a 20-year plan worked out for the care and, and feeding of this particular hockey stick and looking after it. You can see it needs varnishing and uh, maybe retaping. I don't know. <laughs> It, it it hooks to the right. Is that any reflection on the province right now? Well, uh, slightly. I, I, I'd say it hasn't got much of a hook. It's pretty well middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where would you like to see the, the hockey stick and the hockey puck go? Well, I want to see a community, uh, a town, a city in British Columbia that is going to look after it and, and can use it. it it's, as you can see, the, you know, millions and millions of people that were here during this great festival that we had, Expo 86, looked at this hockey stick and uh, there are several cable networks interested in, I think that uh, you, you're aware of, interested in what happens to the hockey stick. It can be a tremendous draw, a tremendous tourist attraction. I want to see a community that's going to look after it and, and have a good plan built around it and have it part of their of, of community effort. If you're interested, there's no firm asking price for the $50,000 memento of the World's Fair. As for the flagpole, the government would be happy if it were to stay right where it is, an integral part of the redevelopment of Falls Creek North. 
That's cute. Well, tomorrow we're going to delve into, my thanks to Ted Rutledge, tomorrow we're going to delve into what happens when a Mountie goes undercover and all the problems allied with that. It should be quite an interesting program. With Webster at 5 p.m. precisely, stay tuned for the news hour.